okay and ray i will introduce you as well okay so uh, alta has some network issues i think so uh, okay so here is uh, we for a webinar uh, on the um, organized by scholarship outreach initiative under ipcs compute so uh, i'm introducing uh, our speaker andre carlo uh, for the webinar uh, topic on uh, my journey through ieee and land staff award lars and student paper award so he will say more about that scholarship and his experience on that okay so i am passing on to him great thank you so much for the introduction i greatly appreciate it can everyone hear me okay on the other side of the line I'll assume yes. If you can't hear me, just send a message in the chat. Uh, so good evening, everyone. If you're joining in from uh, India, it's very exciting to meet you and to speak with you. Uh, I'm joining in from from Canada, so for me it's 8:30 a.m. So it's crazy. Uh, we are like almost on opposite sides of the world, but here we are. I'm I'm talking to you for the first time. So very exciting to meet you, and I want to thank you for taking some of your time to come and listen to uh, my first ever webinar that I will be doing. So I'm very excited, it's new for me, and I hope you will learn something out of it too. So here, I will go ahead and I will put my PowerPoint slide up, and we can get started with the PowerPoint. Awesome. Great. So uh, what, what I will be talking about uh, today with you. So I'll start off by doing a personal introduction and then I'll tell you a little bit about the work experience I have. Uh, then I'll talk with you about uh, my IEEE journey and kind of the different volunteering and awards I have received. Uh, then I'll talk about the Landstar Fort Writing Award, which is the main part. That's kind of what the webinar is about. So I'll tell you how I prepared for it and what the process looked like. And then I'll finish off with the conclusion. So kind of sharing with you, um, you, you know, different, just what, what we learned overall together. So a little bit about me to start things off. So um, I'm from Calgary, Alberta, uh, which is, uh, so Calgary is a city in Canada. So this is it during the summer. That's my downtown uh, in the North Coast. And also I go to the University of British Columbia, which is in also Vancouver, Canada, uh, which is the top two university in Canada. So fantastic university. And I'll talk about UBC a little bit more later. Uh, for some of my personal hobbies, I really like playing tennis. I'm both a competitive tennis player and also a competitive uh, tennis coach. So I've done both and I really love tennis a lot. I really like to do public speaking and I've done model United Nations and speech and debate in high school and university. And also finally, I really like to travel. So uh, this is a picture of me on a dragon's back hike in Hong Kong. So this was fantastic trip and did a lot of hiking there as you can see, beautiful views and a pretty steep drop. So make sure you don't fall off. A little bit more about my university. So as I said, I go to the University of British Columbia in Vancouver campus. It's a very beautiful campus, uh, very green, very sunny. I'm sure many of you have heard of Vancouver before as one of Canada's top cities like Vancouver and Toronto. And also throughout university, uh, and I'll dive a little bit more in my presentation later, uh, but I had a chance to be really involved in the community with a lot of different volunteering opportunities, not all through IEEE. Uh, for example, the photo you're seeing here is uh, Orchard Commons uh, uh, House Council. So this was the first year that the student residence opened up. So I was the house president for Bartlett House. So that was a great opportunity to be involved with UBC campus life. So next, I am an engineer. I'm a UBC engineer. The photo that you see here, we call it red. So the jacket is called a red and it's kind of, it's like this trademark symbol of UBC. And in the background, you can see the big white E, and that's a cairn. It's a huge piece of concrete, and that's kind of what defines the UBC engineers. Specifically, uh, my department is called Integrated Engineering, and it's actually where we do a mix of different engineering disciplines. So we do two different ones. So kind of like in the logo there, it's like I picked perfectly. You can see at the top is civil, and at the bottom is computer. So I'm doing my degree in half computer engineering and half civil engineering. 
So it's like the logo was perfect for me. <laughs> Some of the cool things about the program is that we do a capstone project every year, not just in our last year. So it's a big engineering project. So here you can see we designed Thermosleep, which was a product for people to control their body temperature while they sleep. So this was the year end presentation two years ago. And also, you know, as an engineer, I like to build stuff and do many competitions. So here's a picture of uh, me and my team uh, two years ago. Uh, we're making like a slingshot uh, rocket ship. So we kind of had to, you know, design that, prototype it, and then do a presentation. So that's kind of the things that I do uh, in school and personal life and where I'm from. So the next part is I'll talk a little bit about uh, my work experience and the past experiences I've had. Uh, throughout my undergraduate degree. So I've had three main work experiences, uh, City of Calgary, City of Vancouver, and Suncor. And currently being in my fourth undergraduate year uh, in integra integrated engineering, it's I'd say it's pretty impressive to already have uh, three internships under my belt. So I could also recommend that to you, the more internships you have, the more experience you have for going into the workplace, whether you're an undergraduate student or even a graduate student or already graduated. So for the first experience, I worked in the city of Calgary in 911 emergency services as a business continuity student. So no, I was not driving around in a police car. No, I was not one of those call takers. Uh, that is a cool picture of me in a police car though, because I got to go on a ride along. But uh, the role itself was more creating a disaster recovery plan uh, for the city of Calgary in case of hardware software failures. So I really got to learn about the different systems, uh, hardware and software, and also kind of find out what people used and, and you know how dispatchers operated with police officers, firefighters and paramedics to make sure that information was flowing. So a very cool four month internship in 2017. My second internship was an eight month with the city of Vancouver as a project coordinator for the project delivery branch. So you can see up there that was on my last day. So you know we got some donuts and we got a cool team picture. And our picture on the right is me out at site in downtown Vancouver. So there I was helping to do different economic analysis, risk analysis, and do different project documentation for different street and water projects in the city. So again, a really cool eight month experience where I really got to work with different project managers and even the uh, branch manager, which was very, very cool. And I got a lot of exposure on, on different engineering projects. So this kind of helped me get more awareness into the technical field since the last role was only as a business analyst. And then finally, uh, this is the internship that I'm currently in. Excuse me. So I'm working at Suncor Energy. It's an integrated energy company uh, based in Calgary, Alberta. That's where I am right now. And the team that I work on here is autonomous haulage systems. So um, it's like autonomous trucks. So if you look in the camera here, I have like this little cube and you can see there's some uh, there's some haul trucks in there. So these things are huge. They're like two story buildings driving around. And then imagine having a computer controlling them. So nobody's driving these huge trucks. So it's like autonomously driving trucks instead of cars. So as you can see picture on the left, that's me in front of a tire. Uh, the tire is very expensive. <laughs> so I want to try a little activity with you in one second here. And then on the top right, there is an app that my team developed. So this is showing real-time data of the autonomous trucks. And on the bottom right, that's me doing a presentation for grade nine students on uh, Suncor Bring Your Kids to Homework Day. So I want to pause for one quick second here, just do a little fun activity, very, very small, just to kind of get your, your hands typing and a little bit engaged. So in the Google Meets chat at the bottom, uh, what I want you to do is I'm going to ask you multiple choice question just for fun about this, this tire. So if you can open up your chat window and what I want you to do is I want you to guess how much that tire costs that I'm standing beside and I'll give you multiple choice. So what I want you to do is to type in the chat, uh, but don't hit enter yet. Uh, type A if you think it costs $20,000. B if it costs 40,000, C, if it costs 60,000, or D, if it costs $80,000. So type, type your letter in the chat, don't press enter. A for 20, B for 40, C for 60, and D for 80. And we'll see if we can hit submit at the same time, but I see there's a few already submitting, so that's totally okay. 
So this is in US dollars as well. So let's try it. So three, two, one, hit submit. Let's see what you wrote. I'll take a look here at the chat. Okay, we have, okay, a lot of C's, a lot of D's, you even more C's. Kind of split between the B and C range. Awesome. So you guys were very close. It is $80,000. This tire cost D, $80,000, just one. And these trucks, I think, have like six or eight tires. So, and that's not even the, all like the equipment. So it's a very, very expensive truck to be working with. Um, but still, very, very, very cool stuff, and and you know, very, very exciting. So cool. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, so next, what I'd like to talk with you about is the first part of the presentation, uh, which will be about my Triple E journey and kind of how I got involved and got started in Triple E, and then how I had a chance to experience both uh, you know national Triple E and also international Triple E. So here's a quick overview slide. Um, there's a lot on here. I'll go through some of these with you, not all of them. <laughs> and then, um, but the main one that we will be focusing on here is obviously the Lance Starford Larson Student Award, which will which will be at the end. But otherwise, I'll kind of talk about the other ones uh, right from 2015. That's the year when I graduated high school to 2020, uh, where we are now. So uh, we start things off at the IEEE ICCICC conference in 2016. Uh, this stands for International Conference on Cognitive Informatics and Cognitive Computing. So as you can see in the bottom picture there, to my left is Professor Ying Shu Wang of University of Calgary in the Computer Science Department. And I was lucky enough to get in touch with him after graduating from high school. And he offered me a volunteering position at this conference that he chairs. In, in Stanford University, California, USA. So obviously being very excited to get my foot into IEEE and to start getting involved, I said yes. So it was an amazing opportunity to, you know, over summer of 2016, arrive to Stanford University and help with setting up of the conference, giving out pamphlets, having, you know, different people signed in and also helping with technical support during presentations. And this, you know, was my first real experience into like cognitive informatics and cognitive computing, like machine learning, robotics, automation, any really topic you can think of that falls under those, those categories. That was my first opportunity to be exposed. And it was so interesting and so inspiring to listen to the different speakers and, and hear what they had to say. And this is kind of what really kickstarted my journey into IEEE. And even there in the top right corner, you can see is a picture with me with uh, Professor Witold Kinsner, who was IEEE past Canada president uh, from 2016 to 2017. So I could encourage, you know, if you have a chance to go volunteer somewhere, whether at your local student branch or in any conference or organization, like this is the best way to get involved because you see what people are researching, you see what people are doing, and you see the amazing things out there. So that's kind of what really got me into it. The following year, um, because of such a good volunteering experience with Professor Ying Shu Wang, I was actually invited back uh, as a volunteer, but also I, I submitted a paper to uh, the IEEE ICC 2017 and it was accepted. So I was both a volunteer for the conference and a presenter at the conference. Like I was both at once, which is like, wow, you don't, you don't hear about that very often. <laughs> So um, at the University of Oxford in UK, uh, one of the top universities in the world, a beautiful campus, amazing research. And again, the professors that, that came there and I had a chance to meet, just absolutely amazing people with amazing research. So as you can see the picture on the left, that's me doing my first ever research paper talk. So no, this was not the same research paper as uh, the Lance Starford scholarship that I submitted. This was a different research paper on quality estimation for facial biometrics. Now, maybe at the end, if we have some time, I can tell you more about it. Um, but just ask me a question at the end and, uh, and then I'll be able to, to answer it for you. Um, and then again, volunteering for the conference, similar things, meeting new people, helping people sign in. So again, amazing experience. And not only did I have a chance to be behind the volunteering booth, but I also had a chance to be on the stage presenting for, you know, world renowned professors and scientists. So truly one of the coolest IEEE experiences I've had to date, nothing compares to it. It's, it's fantastic. 
So I'll just do a quick pause here, and maybe if you have a quick question, you can type it in the chat just so I can answer it for you. Maybe that's something that we can do. If, if you have any questions, you can kind of type them in the chat and I'll kind of watch as they come up. If you have bigger questions, maybe save them for the end. So maybe in like around like around uh, 8.40 p.m. India time or uh, 9, 10 a.m. Uh, Calgary time. But otherwise, I'll just keep going. And if you have questions, uh, you, you can you can push into the chat and I'll check the chat every every few minutes here. So kind of continuing on with the presentation. So after the IEEE experience, a uh, very interesting happened where it kind of allowed me to apply for the Southern Alberta Section Leadership Scholarship. Since I had a lot of volunteering opportunities at UBC, uh, like academic representative, uh, vice, vice president of my first house council, the picture that I showed you, and also as a residence advisor for my first year residence. And as well, I had now these IEEE experiences at these conferences volunteering, which, which also showing leadership because I'm helping other volunteers during the conference. So nonetheless, I applied and I got it. So in 2017, I was the recipient of the IEEE SAS Leadership Scholarship. So, you know, again, it's just kind of more incentive for me to keep getting involved both in, um, you know, extracurricular activities and volunteering positions in school, and to also keep going back to these IEEE ICC conferences. Oh, yes. Any question? No, okay, no worries. I'll keep going then. And yeah, so it was fantastic opportunity to get the scholarship. Very grateful for the Southern Alberta section. And as you can see picture on the right, that is Dale Tardif, who was past chair of IEEE Southern Alberta section in 2017 and 2018. So, you know, also just, you know, expanding uh, my network to have more information. Cool. I have two quick questions here. How was it to be standing in front of a well-versed crowd? Uh, thanks for your question, Vishnu. I'll answer it quickly now and then more at the end. But, you know, it's so like being just an undergraduate student in front of a crowd of, you know, world professors with years of research, very intimidating. <laughs> so, um, But, you know, I just did a lot of practice with the presentation, prepared as much as I could, made sure that I was clear on what the topic and what the data was in the presentation. So even when I was asked questions at the end, I could answer confidently and with clarity. So just being prepared was the biggest thing. But, you know, obviously it's going to be a little bit anxious first time. And at least here we have the laptop screen. So I'm protected a little bit from, from you guys. There's 36 of you. Wow. Um, but otherwise, just a lot of practice. And so, and a quick question from uh, Tija here, must the paper be submitted or presented at IEEE conference or could it be any other conference? Uh, so no, it does not have to be. Um, I just used my paper. I also had a chance to present it as I will show you in another slide, but no, the paper does not have to be submitted or presented. And uh, you can ask more questions of IEEE Computer Society, but to my knowledge, uh, you do not have to. Cool, so we'll jump back to presentation here. So after IEEE scholarship, uh, we went back to ICCI 2018, where I was invited back. And this is the year when I presented the same paper that won the second place at the Land Starford scholarship. And I'll talk about more about the, the research project itself later, uh, but it was on convolutional neural networks in machine learning, estimating relations in the Ising model on overfitting. Okay, so that's a lot. That sounds like a lot. I'll explain it later. Don't worry, it lost to me too the first time our team came up with the title, so don't worry. <laughs> so as you can see here, it's at the University of Berkeley in California, USA. So had a chance to go down there and again volunteered for the conference and also was a presenter for the conference. And you can see top right, that's me with some of the other volunteers. On the posters, the chairs of the conference, and a picture on the left is me presenting on just on the first slide of contributions. And you can even see the title of the presentation there on convolutional neural networks. So again, amazing experience. And so thankful I had a chance to be invited back. And then finally, in 2019, so last year I was invited for the fourth time for volunteering opportunities at the conference at Polytechnic University of Milan in Italy. So beautiful campus, amazing city. This was last year, so super beautiful. We could all travel. I even wanted to go back to Italy this summer, but unfortunately we had to cancel because of the situation. So, but I do hope to go back when I can. And as you can see, there's a picture on the right there with all the conference attendees or some of them who could make the picture. 
and then I'm just standing in the middle, uh, middle left there. So again, uh, unfortunately this time, uh, no research project to submit, uh, but otherwise very, very exciting to have a chance just to attend the conference, listen to different speakers and ask questions of, of different individuals. I'll check if there's any questions here. Nope, we're still good. So we will, we will keep going here. So uh, those are kind of uh, for volunteering experiences. I have two more that I'd like to share. Uh, so the first one, which I'm currently active in, is the IEEE Student Activities Committee. And the most interesting part of this experience was that uh, actually one of the professors at the, at the conference, uh, which was uh, Professor Wittold Kinsner, he actually referred me uh, to join this committee uh, just to be continue being involved in IEEE activities. So the most important, you know, I think the most um, ironic thing in, in this role is that at the time of accepting, I was actually on a student exchange at the National University of Singapore in Singapore. So kind of like you are halfway across the world from me, I was halfway across the world from my IEEE Canada Society and my team, <laughs> almost 12 hour difference, I think it was 11 hours, Singapore to Calgary time. So, you know, the most ironic timing, but still nonetheless, I accepted. So uh, with the IEEE Student Activities Committee, this is where we wanted to deliver common high quality student member experience, just like other student branches, uh, to IEEE students and student branches throughout Canada across our universities. Uh, so to share a little bit with you about uh, what IEEE Student Activities does, uh, I'd like to share with you a quick video. So audio should come through. Uh, so I'll just drag it up here on the screen for you. One moment here. All right, so it'll be a quick two minute video. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Well, I am uh, Rafi Malik. Uh, I am the current chair for IEEE site. The reason I joined uh, IEEE uh, in general in the first place was because uh, I wanted to work for the projects um, that provide humanitarian uh, aid using technology. Um, and IEEE is a platform that not only gives you financial resources, but also uh, technical resources um, that could uh, put you on the right path to basically carry out the projects in a field that, that you believe in. My name is Leanne Johnson. I'm the current Women in Engineering Student Branch Chair. I joined IEEE because it is important as a graduate student to be an IEEE member so we can publish and attend conferences. But I got involved with IEEE as a volunteer so that I could help support other females in engineering and provide opportunities for them that I wish I had had as an undergraduate student. I joined IEEE when a classmate at university invited me to join and I'm really glad that I did. I got to go to power plant tours, substation tours, and I also got various scholarships throughout it. I'm Dale Tardif and I was chair of the Southern Alberta section and now I'm past chair. About 10 years ago, I got much more actively involved with IEEE in volunteer and, and leadership positions. The main reason for me to do that was an opportunity to meet other professionals. And so it was helpful to be able to, to get advice and get information from them and, and learn things that otherwise wouldn't have been easy to learn. Tim Driscoll, and I'm an IEEE Life Fellow. Got involved in IEEE because of uh, standards and heavily involved in conference organizing right now. Hi, I'm Rob Sa. Uh, I'm going to University of Calgary and I'm doing my electrical engineering there. I finished my third year of electrical engineering and when I joined IEEE in my second year. The reason I joined I hope you'll be part of it in the future. Okay, so that's the video there. So thank you so much for watching that. <clears throat> uh, if you are interested in the video or if it didn't come through perfectly, um, I will provide a link at the end of the presentation to the organizer so that the organizer can send it out to you just in case you need it. Okay, so I'll get the PowerPoint back up on the screen. 
And I think there's a quick question here. Um, how were you able, so this is from Sidhant, how were you able to get the volunteering opportunities outside your region? Uh, were they funded by your section or IEEE in any capacity? And yeah, thank you for the video. <laughs> Um, for, yeah, so this is a great, great question as well, just to ask here at the end. So all the volunteering opportunities uh, that I that I had a chance to, um, it was just me reaching out to people, really. So finding contacts, uh, my IEEE student branch, I really wasn't uh, too involved on that aspect, but it was more just reaching out to people that were involved in IEEE and asking, can I volunteer for you? Can I help you out in any way? So that's kind of what got me the golden ticket into, into my path that kind of just, you know, skyrocketed and went full turbo speed ahead with different volunteering opportunities. So I just recommend asking as many people as you can for, for, for involvement and asking for opportunities and you keep asking, good things will come your way. So great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, one more uh, volunteering experience I'll share. This is the last one. It's the IEEE Extreme Programming Competition. Uh, so this is just one of the other ones. And also um, after I was on the Student Activities Committee uh, here in this one, I was actually referred by the chair, Jamil Alam, to join the IEEE program competition as first an ambassador. Uh, but then I was actually selected as a region lead for Canada. So I, I manage and help volunteer for all of the different uh, ambassadors across all Canada regions. So as you can see there, uh, those are the five region leads that we currently have. And of course, I will do a self plug. If you are interested in applying for programming competition, visit IEEEExtreme.org. Uh, so just Google it. And then if you're interested in coding, have so much experience or no experience at all, it's for both sides. So if you're interested, feel free to Google it at the end. Great. So that's kind of about my volunteering experience and my IEEE journey. Uh, any questions uh, so far about uh, different volunteering opportunities or anything like that? Oh, cool. We have a few questions. I'll maybe answer some of them and save the other ones for the end. Uh, so yes, uh, we will share the video at the end. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that the organizer of the con of this webinar can publish the on the YouTube channel. Uh, you, so Manihal asks, uh, Manahil, sorry, I'm not IEEE member, but volunteer, will I be eligible? Uh, so I do believe you do have to be an IEEE member uh, to apply for the Lance Starford Larson Writing Award. Uh, but if uh, you know you want to clarify more, uh, you might have to get the IEEE membership or you could message uh, one, of, one of the contacts from the IEEE Computer Society. Since I'm not too sure on the exact details of the award, um, but but I feel that I in the criteria, and we will go over this in the slide here, so maybe that will answer your question. And one more question here from Pabidra. How did you get the connection of the chair, uh, Ying Shu Wang? No problem. And of course, yes, I wish to research and connect with, with other professors. Yes, I think we all want to connect as much as we can. So um, I was able to connect with the professor as so my, my own mom. She works at the University of Calgary. She's a professor. And so she worked in a similar department as Professor Ying Shu Wang. So in kind of me trying to go around and ask different friends and peers and I guess even family members in this case, uh, you know, who I wish I triple members or professors do you know? Uh, this is where very luckily I was referred to Professor Ying Shu Wang and I had a chance to meet with him, have a coffee. And then he he decided that he did was looking for volunteers for the conference. So that's kind of how he invited me for the first year, just as a demo. And then because it was so successful, that's why he kept inviting me back each year. And this summer, I don't think there will be a conference, uh, but in the future, there, there might be more, which I hope there will be. So great question here. Okay, so the part you've, you've I think, been waiting for, uh, I'd be very happy to talk with you about the, uh, the actual staff Larson Award, kind of uh, how I applied, how I found out about it, and then also some tips and tricks for you on writing your research paper, your research project, and also applying for, for the contest. So it is hosted by IEEE Computer Society. You can just type on Google and look online. And the nomination deadline each year is October 31st. So they will be opening the next one, uh, I think at the beginning of June here. So you can't apply just yet or beginning of July, we will see, but you can check on the website, it will be opening up soon. Uh, the award itself is based on the Larson family, just like in the text down there. And it's in order to encourage students to develop excellence in communication skills and motivate them for field of computer science. 
there is a monetary award each year, so it's five hundred dollars for the first place, and then second and third place uh, get a certificate of of commendation. So some more information about it: uh, it's open for all IEEE student members, and if you are undergraduate student or a graduate student, there is one award for each category. So you're competing in different categories there. Some criteria of the award, it has to be for no more than 20 pages, a student paper. And I'll talk with you a little bit more about how to get started on a student paper. And it can be of any computer related subject, kind of like the different topics that I had, like machine learning and parallelization of random forests and facial biometric recognition. So really any field that you feel is computer related or computer science related, uh, it's a great topic to apply. And then obviously on the website, there's the application form. So all you have to do is click on it, log in, and you will see all this information there. So really for the award itself, there's not that much criteria that you have to apply for, which makes this one of the better awards to apply for. And as well, besides having a student paper, all you really need to do is write one. I think when I applied two years ago, there was just one research, just one question that I had to answer, like one paragraph question. Why do you want to apply for this award? Like, why should we pick you? So just some supporting evidence for the paper, because the paper is the main thing. That's what you will have to focus your time on. So um, how I really got started with getting into research opportunities was with the URO club at UBC, which uh, was undergraduate research opportunities club. So this was a really cool club at uh, my university. Uh, very glad I got to join where it paired me up with other students wanting to do research with a professor or a grad student that already had research ongoing and they could either help us on their research or we could do a whole new research project altogether. So right in my first year of university, like first year student, I uh, did a project on parametric building design, which was in the field of civil engineering. In my second year, I did a project on machine learning and parallelization of random forests. And then finally, this convolutional neural networks, this is the paper that I submitted that started out as a research project, but turned into a paper and was also presented at the ICCI conference on convolutional neural networks. So what I'll do now, I'll give you a really quick run through like two minutes on like the main ideas of what the research paper is about so that before we get into the research paper, you will kind of know what is one of the topics that we did for a research project so maybe it can inspire you to pursue a field that you want to pursue or to start a research project yourself. So this was the introductory slide. So there were four of us members and we had our mentor. And as you can see, this was at ICCI 2018. So this is just a little meme, but the idea is image classification is complex. So if you are trying to do machine learning on image recognition, kind of like you can search in Google with an image now, that is very complex. There's a lot of stuff going on in the background, but machine learning can help. And specifically, we can use the CNN in order to try to take in an image and then output it as a probability value that best describes an image. So for example, you can see on the left, it's a picture of a boat. You know, we as humans, we can, we can figure that out pretty easily. And how machine learning works is it takes an, a, a part of the image and then it breaks it up by convoluting, pooling, convoluting, pooling, et cetera. And then taking all these little pixels and trying to figure out in relation to how are they next to each other and then getting an output prediction. So as you can see there, this neural network that we just pulled from offline, it thinks that this is a boat 94%, a cat 4%, a bird 2% and a dog 1%. So then the image would go back and tell me, we think this is a boat. So yes, that is correct. It's a very good learning algorithm. Specifically, in the project that we did, we wanted to try to figure out what is the effect of overfitting or underfitting on data. A quick definition, overfitting is when a trained model cannot differentiate newly input data from its test data. So this is when it's too accurate. So this is where, like, let's say you show me a picture of 100 blocks. Hello, Andre, your sound is missing. Hello, are you there? 
I think there is some network issues or something. Okay, I think he had some network issues. He will rejoin soon. Okay. Yeah, please wait, guys. Uh, he will be back soon. I think he face he is facing some network issues or something. Okay, I will check. Yeah, he's back. Okay. Thank you, Andre, for rejoining. Okay, you can continue now. Hello, are you there? Sorry, hello. Uh, my connection. Um, yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. My apologies. We are yeah. we are back here, so I will share the screen now. Um, do you know if I could ask you um, where where we stopped off in the presentation? Where it was dropped off? Uh, Salih, maybe if you can help. Oh, I need to share my screen. Sorry about that. Of course, there's technical issues since we're presenting halfway across the world and my, my Wi-Fi just, just dies on me. Of course, that would happen. I should have guessed. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, everybody. We are trying to get it back. The overfitting. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm gonna to Tochuko. Sorry if I said that name wrong. <laughs> okay, so hopefully we can we can right here is good. Sure. Sorry again, everybody, for for that brief interruption uh, interruption there. So we will continue with the presentation here. So thanks for your patience. So a quick quick run through here. Uh, so we left off at uh, you know how can machine learning help us uh, get through the presentation. So overfitting and underfitting. Uh, overfitting is when a trained model cannot differentiate from newly input data. And underfitting is when a trained model cannot under, under accurately capture the underlying structure of the data. So in either case, you don't want overfitting and you don't want underfitting. Uh, both of these are, are not good. You, you don't want this. So what we did in the research project is the next thing, we had a research question. So what impact do network parameters, specifically learning rate and regularization rate, have on the adaptability of convolutional neural networks? So this is quite a big chunk of statement, but don't worry, we'll just kind of go speed run, don't worry about this part too much. 
We had a methodology of selecting images, putting them through a network architecture, doing some CNN learning, observing the performance, and then finally getting conclusion. So I'll give one example of testing here. Uh, these are the different parameters we passed in. We had training accuracy of 100% and test accuracy of 30% when we passed in these parameters. So I want to ask you a quick question here, and you just have to think to yourself, no need to kind of respond or type anything in the chat. So do you think that with training accuracy 100 and test accuracy 30, would this be data that is overfit, so too accurate, or underfit, where the testing accuracy, we're not sure what it is? So just take a second to think there, do you think this data is overfit or underfit? Okay, if you were thinking that the data is overfit, you are correct. Because we have training accuracy 100%, the data set never got a single image wrong. But when we took away the labels, the accuracy dropped to 30%, which means that the network was overtrained and the data overfit. So some research outcomes that we had, low legalization rate and learning rate yields overfit data, which is the example we just saw. And you know, just more information about the regularization rate here. High learning rate yields unfit data. And for our conclusion of the research project, we just, again, recap the data. We find that properly tuning the learning and regularization rate prevent the model from overfitting or underfitting. And we found we want high regularization, large data set, and low training rate. And finally, higher testing accuracy corresponds to reduced loss function. So again, the point of this was not really to have you fully understand it. We can talk more after the, the presentation, but more just to show you what does a research project look like. And obviously this is just one example. There can be many different ones. So um, next part is we'll talk about kind of how to write a successful application and kind of final tips on the research paper itself. So the two main points that I'd like to share, the first one is having an idea. And the second point, having the resources to, to have a research project. So the first one was having an idea of how to present the research paper. So this is where I was lucky enough to be part of the URO uh, UBC student group. And there I was with a team of three other students and a grad student or even a professor. And this is where we bounced ideas off each other. Personally, I'm very interested in machine learning and other group members were also interested. So we all agreed that that was one way that we could kind of all do a research project. And the professor also helped us, you know, create the machine learning algorithm in Python so we could do some testing on the research project you saw. So the first thing there is having an idea. You want to be passionate or you just want to have something that you're interested in that you want to pursue or learn more about. And it doesn't even have to be in the computer science realm or computer informatics realm. It can be in any realm you want since Research paper can be either technical or even psychological, emotional, or anything that you like. I've seen lots of different research projects on any category you can think of. The second point that I want to stress is having the resources. And one way to do this is asking the experts. Right from day one of, of being involved in IEEE, I met so many professors at different conferences and at my university. And even though I wasn't involved in my student branch, I'm sure a lot of you are much more involved. So that is a great place to start by just asking different members, sending a quick message on Facebook or Telegram or WhatsApp, just asking, hey, do you have any contacts in IEEE that are familiar with field X? And then this is the way that you can then ask different people about you know, are you involved in this field and how can you help me do my research in this field and maybe I can give something back to you. So just like I had the involvement with the different professors, both at UBC and also in the conferences, I can also encourage you that once you have an idea and if you wanna do it by yourself or with a team, either one is great. I'm sure people would wanna join you though. All you have to do is ask around and it's the hardest part I feel, even harder than finding an idea because you might not be sure if your idea is good or if you want to pursue it. But this is the best recommendation I can give is first having an idea of a research idea that you want to pursue and then asking around just to see who will help you support your idea. And people nowadays are very supportive. I found most of the people I talked to were very willing to give me new ideas or bounce off different thoughts. So again, that's probably the best way to go for, for resources. Uh, here's a picture of the research paper uh, that I submitted uh, into the uh, Lance Starford Larson Writing Award. So this is just following regular format of a research paper. It's about six pages. Um, so as you can see, I can't show you really much more just because of copyright, because the paper was published. Uh, but as you can see here, we start off with an introduction. There's a literature review. 
And also throughout the presentation, and kind of like you saw in the PowerPoint slide, uh, in this paper, I have lots of different figures just being very clear and trying my best to write. So kind of the way that I wrote this paper and a little tip I could give is just I started out by taking the content that was in the research project and trying to expand on each slide. So trying to get, go as deep as possible, reference as many literature reviews. So there was obviously a lot of research that went into this to try to find what previous research on image recognition is there and using CNNs and there's tons. So it just took a lot of time and I had support from my team members up there as you can see on the top just to kind of make this paper into fruition and then have it not only submitted to the Lance Starford Larson Award, but even having it published as well. So this was probably one of the coolest things that happened in my life, having you know my first paper published you know in, in my third year of undergraduate society. So if you're interested, uh, you can just search up convolutional networks. Um, if you want to purchase it, go for it. I don't get any money off it, so I'm not going to try to you know force you into buying it. Um, or I think the best thing would be just just talk to me about it. So you can message me on Messenger or LinkedIn. I will send you some links at the end, and then if you have any questions, you can just ask me there. Cool. So let's get to the end of the presentation here and kind of do a recap. So uh, what's next for me, and also what's next for you? So, you know, I'm still applying for different scholarships. Uh, I'm not really that involved in research paper writing anymore as I'm trying to develop my technical career. Uh, and I'm also doing a summer course at UBC online. So really what I would say is the more involved you are, the more things will come to you. That That's kind of the, the leaving point I can leave with you. Because from the first time I was involved in the ICCI conference in 2016, it just led to more and more good things happening. Or even though I wasn't really sure what my future was going to be looking like, or what experience I was going to have, it really just allowed me to see into the world of IEEE and also just see the different things that are going out there. What research do people do? What opportunities are there? And how can I get involved? So that's just the biggest point I would say, no matter if you are in your first year of undergraduate, or even if you're like in your third year of master's or PhD or wherever you are, or even going into your professional career, there's never a time to say no. It's always beneficial to be involved because you're not only are you learning, but you're also meeting new people and therefore you will just have more doors open to you in life. So again, what I can recommend is go to IEEE Computer Society and just type in Landstar for Larson Student Award. Uh, this is kind of how you will just be involved in, in the project and get involved into the scholarship. And even if you don't win it, or like me, I got second place, just a certificate. Still such an amazing experience to apply for the award, you know, make the research paper, take that extra step to actually publish the research paper. And now that's kind of with me for the rest of my life. So there's no downsides from this. And even if I wouldn't have won an award, any award first, second or third, it probably just would have been most exciting experience possible. So I only got good things out of it, and I'm sure that you will too. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you so much for taking these last 50 minutes to listen to the webinar. And again, sorry for the technical issue. I think we can use the last 10 minutes here to have a conversation session, ask any questions. So if you have a question, you can either type it in the chat, and I can read it off. Or if you'd like to untune your mic, uh, you can also do that and ask me directly. So thank you again. Uh, let's, let's see if there's any questions out there. So uh, Pavitra, thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, so I, it can, it does not have to be a new work. It can, it can be any published paper there. So if you have any student paper that you wrote that was either in your undergraduate or your graduate society, you just have to say when you wrote the student paper. So for example, like if I wrote it three years ago and that was during undergrad, but now I'm in grad, that would not work because you have to make sure that you are applying for the same period that you are in. So just make sure that it matches up if you're an undergrad or if you're in graduate studies. And then you can you can either use an existing work or you can use a new work. Hey, okay. Uh, Muhammad asked a question. Uh, how do you look for an idea? That's a great question. Um, it's hard. It's really, really hard to, to look for a new idea. And I'm sure many of us that have done research projects or papers, I, it's, it's difficult because you, the, the advice I could give of how I came up with new ideas 
it always starts with the brainstorming. And I'd say like the first two weeks of starting like any research, we probably had like 10 ideas of what we wanted to do. And this was just like student meeting after student meeting after student meeting, throwing as much stuff we can onto the whiteboard, like the stupidest ideas, the smartest ideas, the any ideas. We just have to get any ideas out. And we do this just, you know, think, think deep in your brain, think what topics interest you. So, you know, for me, I'm interested in machine learning and, and facial recognition systems. So, okay, I do a quick Google search, what research exists, what the hell is out there? And then that is how I go. And then I just get some of these ideas, put them on the whiteboard. The other students also bring some new ideas. Boom, we have 20 ideas. Now we can start going through each one and thinking, is this actually a good research idea? Or is this maybe not the best one for here? And then we can narrow them down so that would be the best advice I could give on how to come up with an idea. Go online to what topic you are interested in, do a quick Google search and take some ideas and then try to get your idea to stem from one of those. So great question, but even though it sounds easy, it's very difficult. <laughs> okay. um, Hello. Question on the mic? Yes. Yeah, hi, what's your name? Yeah. Uh, hi, Orizulio. Hi. Yeah, so I have one question. Does the uh, idea need to be related to technical fields? Okay. So uh, I'm going to jump back in the presentation here to the slide where it's the criteria. So it just has to be computer related. And it has to be computer related subject and presented at a computer related conference or publication are eligible. So it does have to be technical in nature. Um, but it just has to be computer related. So if you do have a question about if yours is exactly computer related or not, I would just recommend reaching out to the organizers of, of the scholarship. And if the sooner you do it, the better. It's even before the release date. Uh, so the IEEE Computer Society would be able to direct you to that. But I would think, yes, it does have to be mainly on technical content. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Of course. So I'll be kind of quick here with the answers. Uh, Siddhant, does the impact factor of journal conference matter for the award consideration? Uh, so again, I'm not on the award committee, but I would think no, it does not. So, you know, again, I first applied, I was kind of applying for the scholarship and also publishing the paper at the same time. It, that's just how it happened. Um, but I don't think it has an impact. It, it's mainly just based on the content of the paper itself. So that's where you have proper grammar, you have good data points, and it's clear, concise with images, kind of like the image that you saw of the research paper here. And I can just put it up uh, one more time uh, just, for, just for your viewing here. Um, but really, I don't think it has to do with that. It's definitely a bonus, but that's just more for you. So Vishnu, uh, I'm just starting on learning uh, machine learning. And yes, you are lost. I was very lost too. Uh, there's a lot of different re reference points. How do you think I can start afresh? That's okay, that, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you very much for asking Vishnu. It was very much the same with me. So I was lucky enough to get my first machine learning exposure through that URO club, where that's kind of where the professor gave us like an actual virtual computer to just test around and play around with machine learning. Best advice I could give is to start with a course not a YouTube video, because for me, those are very passive and I'm not involved and I lose attention, but a course, and you can do that either on Coursera or on Udemy. So I'll quickly just type those two into the chat. Those are two uh, websites uh, that, that I have used and I really like them. There's also Code Academy. So those are just three websites for you. Um, that's what I would recommend for starting. Um, that's the best way to just learn about it. But of course, if you're not as intense as me, I'm sure you could search on YouTube and just search like a 10 minute overview on what machine learning is kind of like in the project that I gave you. Uh, that's a good idea too. But yeah, it's really up to you. Um, but for me, I found that courses work the best and that's how I got most involved either online or at your university. So great question, Vishnu. And I wish you best of luck with getting started on machine learning. Cool. Uh, sir, you're so, uh, Mekha here asks, sir, uh, your suggestion for your students to improve our knowledge and technology? Uh, of course, yes, I think it's very important and for and that's good for you as well for, for kind of coming out to these events. Just, just being here at this webinar 
is fantastic because that's how you get exposure. And when I was in first year, I attended lots of conferences, not the ICCI ones like in Vancouver and any conferences that my school offered. So just getting as much involvement as you can, that's the best way that you're really going to learn about you know machine learning or technical skills or, or, or really anything. So I would just say go to your university IEEE branch or just search on university website if there are any conferences coming up. Now there are lots that are happening online and that is kind of the best way for you to get involved, I think. But I totally agree with you. Very important to improve your knowledge on technology and the best way you can get involved is that. Cool, so I think we'll ask one, one final question here before we wrap up. Um, so uh, I'm going to pronounce this name very wrong. I'm very sorry. Shresath, <laughs> Shresath Gupta, <laughs> sorry about that. Which should be a higher priority? Patent the idea or project or represent idea on a research paper? So I'll let everybody think for just two seconds, what do you think is most important? I have an answer in my head, but what do you think is important? The patent or the idea? So for me, and again, it's just an opinion, I think definitely the idea. Because if you don't have an idea, what are you going to patent? So you need to definitely first, I strongly recommend having people support your idea, not trying to patent it or protect it, but first making connections and building friendships that are going to help you take your idea and bring it to fruition. So actually make it into a research paper or just have a research project with some findings, some conclusion, uh, that is probably going to be the best thing for you. Once it starts running off the ground and then maybe you, you have a very solid idea with a solid PowerPoint presentation or project or paper, that's when you can go and look into publishing it with a publisher and that's kind of how you get that patent. So for me, the order was first making the CNN project as you see here, um, first into an idea and then publishing it after I had already presented a conference since I know it's already a good idea. So that was what I would strongly recommend. And it's just going to be building those connections to help you make your project better. Great. So seeing it is uh, 9 p.m. for you and 9.30 a.m. for me, I again want to thank you so much for attending this webinar. It was very, very nice to meet you. I'd be very happy to connect with you after. So as I said in the presentation, I will uh, both send uh, the research uh, or the video that I showed to the organizer. If you want to contact me, just take a screenshot of this slide and then reach out to me. I think email is the best way. Or if you want to connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, and Insta and uh, LinkedIn, that's what we use here in North America. <laughs> I'd be very happy to accept your invite. And I also have WhatsApp. So uh, I, you maybe email me and then we can connect on WhatsApp. So otherwise, thank you again so much for joining the webinar. I hope that you all stay safe and best of luck with your IEEE journeys and any career or aspirations that you have. So thank you so much. I hope to hear from you guys soon. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Thank you for such a wonderful session. It was very interesting. I like the way you presented. So on behalf of the compute team, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, taking the webinar. I would also like to thank each one of them who have participated and actively asked questions and interacted with the speaker. Uh, so I thank you, Andre, once more for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Alpha. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe and take care. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Yeah.